John. Uh, at this point, we will switch the, the slides. John's contact information is there on the, if you want to print out the, his presentation. And uh, at this point, we'll switch over to uh, Dick Nikolai, and he'll talk to us about a study he was doing with shelter belts. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and uh, thank you for uh, everyone for attending uh, our webinar. I'm going to visit with you a little bit about a particular project that we looked at in shelter belts relative to uh, hydrogen sulfide emissions from uh, swine barns. But before I really get into that, I think uh, John did an excellent job of uh, setting the background and the groundwork for what a shelter belt is. But I'm going to do uh, just a quick review here of, of four slides and, uh, so that we're all on the same page. Basically, when we look at a, a shelter belt, we know that the airspeed changes when it goes through it. And for the reasons that uh, John alluded to, such as it goes over, goes through, it's a barrier, or goes around. And this was a study done in back in 1964 where they measured the actual air velocity, the air speed, if you will, coming through a shelter belt, as well as uh, then simulated that model for various uh, conditions and uh, were able to produce a model that would predict the airspeed on both sides of the shelter belt. So we know that the airspeed does slow down uh, just beyond the shelter belt. And so the conditions that we have in a barn in a livestock setting is that the shelter belts then, if they're before or after the system, will cause the air to go aloft and uh, continue in the mixing as well as, as moves forward away from that. Basically, the, the action that happens right near the shelter belt is the air rises, we have the uh, trees acting as an intercept for the dust particulates and reduces the amount of dust being uh, pushed forward, as John alluded to. And then the air coming back down to the atmosphere, uh, to the ground level, as it moves away from the uh, shelter belt. There was uh, some research done recently in 2008 that looked at um, the odor actual odor relative to the shelter belt. And this is the distance away from the shelter belt. And it uh, kind of says this is really what happens. And uh, there's a lot of antidote information that uh, can kind of confirms this. As you move away from the shelter belt, you become less and less odorous. And so there was a simulation done, and they were able to do a modeling of the effect of that. This work was done in Canada at that point in time. But there was also some work done in Australia about the same time that looked at, and this was a modeling exercise, and what they did is they modeled the shelter belt, and they said, okay, there is, if we have no windbreak, we will have this situation where we have the odor decreasing as we move away from the shelter belt or the buildings themselves. If we have a windbreak, we will also move and decrease the odor. And their modeling said just beyond the shelter belt, we're going to get about 50% reduction in odor. But as we move away and distance away, at some point in time, there will be no effect of that shelter belt. So. The concern that we have with uh, looking at recommending shelter belts for odors for residents downstream or away from the building site is how much credit can we give to the shelter belt? Should we give the 50% or as we move away, should we give less and less? And that was the premise for my research that we did here at uh, SDSU to begin to look at what is the effect of the shelter belt further downstream or away from the shelter belt. So basically what we did is um, we took a site that was way out in the middle of nowhere and uh, in South Dakota it's, it's really possible to do that on a relatively level site where we don't have topography involved in it. And we wanted to measure the effect the shelter belt has on hydrogen sulfide dispersion. We chose hydrogen sulfide over odor 
being that there is really not a good instrument to measure odor other than the human nose, whereas we can have electronic instruments to measure hydrogen sulfide. Some of the sub-projects that we wanted to look at within this project is what is the effect of uh, shelter belt porosity? In other words, is there one row, two row, or three rows be more effective and how much more effective as we reduce, increase the porosity or reduce the porosity? Secondly, we know that the atmosphere has various stability classes, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit later and define that. But we wanted to know the effect of various stability classes on the movement of the odor and uh, gases away from the building site. So we took this basically uh, uninhibited site, and we began to analyze it, and we said we're going to put in a windbreak along this area right here, and we're going to spade in our trees. So we can measure the same source, which is the barns right here, with and without a shelter belt. We used an SPM monitor to measure the accuracy, and the SPM monitor will have various uh, accuracies depending upon the range that you uh, attribute to the uh, monitor the uh, gas range, that is, and, uh, and how it is set up. For our particular situation, we had it set up that we were accurate within two uh, parts per billion. We put our monitors out at the beginning before the building site so we could get the background, and then we put them just right outside the building as well as just beyond the trees, and then at distances up to a half mile away from here and here that we would have on the, uh, to look at the effect of the trees. We knew in the summertime that the prevailing winds, such as John, used those in those um, wind roses, that the winds are out of the south, southeast, and uh, if this, uh, the way the orientation is right now, to the right of the, your screen is to the north, the up is to the west, and so the south is off to the left, and the, so the, the wind would be coming out of the south, and we would then uh, monitor most of the air at that point in time. This is the picture of the site without the shelter belt. This is where the trees would be spaded in, and we would then analyze the situation from that. In the bean field next to the building site, we set up our monitors. They consisted of a pole and the, the uh, hydrogen sulfide monitor here, we measured at two different levels, right at above the beans at one meter above the ground, and as well as at five and a half meters above the, uh, the ground. We used a weather station to monitor the direction and the uh, airspeed, and, so and the solar radiation to obtain our um, stability of our atmosphere. The next slide shows the uh, first row of trees that were spaded in then. We measured each of these situations for about six weeks, and when the wind was blowing out of the south or southeast in that, we kept that data. When the wind happened to be blowing out of the, any other direction, that data was discarded. And so this would be one row of trees, and then after we finished that, we spaded in a second row of tree of evergreen trees and they uh, provided a little more uh, restriction. Uh, each of these two rows were approximately 15 to 20 feet tall. The third row of trees was a little bit taller. It was about 25 to 30 foot, and it was on the, the back side of the uh, shelter belt. And so we were now being able to measure for about six weeks this situation. In each of these situations, we were when the air was moving in the right direction, we were able to uh, measure the stability classes. But this, first of all, I wanted to uh, show you the porosity differences between each of the rows. The first row had approximately 84% pore, so it was quite open, and we could allow a lot of air to go through. The second row was about 51% or 50%, and then we're only 30, or about 40%, 38-40% on the uh, third row. So we could analyze the data from uh, different uh, porosities and begin to uh, 
to work on a model that would uh, kind of predict what each of the uh, trees would do. The stability of the air is defined into six different classes according to the U.S. Uh, Weather Service. And they use these classes A, B, C, D, and F, which go from very unstable air to stable air. And the stability is based on the cloud cover, the amount of solar radiation that we have, the wind speed, the air temperature, and uh, the, anything that would affect the air. So an example of a very unstable air would be a bright, sunny day where we have a lot of sunshine, that we have a very definite temperature gradient from the soil on up to uh, higher elevations. And as the stability, uh, the air would have a temperature gradient, we have very, uh, quite a bit of vertical movement of the air from the ground up. So even if we don't have any wind, we can have a very unstable situation and get a lot of mixing of the air. Whereas in a stable situation, such as classes E and F, they would be described as a cloudy day with not very much, or in the twilight, nor towards evening, a very low wind, just a slight amount of breeze, maybe one to four miles an hour, something that's going to keep that plume together as it moves downstream. And so the effect of keeping that plume together would have a higher concentration and we're not getting any dispersion. So we wanted to monitor the stability and has its effect on the shelter belt. So during the frequency uh, the experiment, we experienced this many uh, frequencies of recurrences of the various uh, stability classes. Not very much unstable air as we had it. Most of the time we were in a neutral situation, a C or D, in very little time that we had a, a very stable air that it didn't mix with the uh, air plumes and it just hung together as it moved away from the buildings. And so based on that, we were able to, to analyze the data in various situations. So this would be the shelter belts at both the five and a half meters as well as the one meter height without any shelter belt. And so this was the air that we came at. We see that right above the beans that we had very little difference in the hydrogen sulfide concentration as it moved away from the building downstream. This particular red line that you see here is about seven parts per billion. That I put on there just for your information is that's generally considered between five and seven parts per billion is the detection odor threshold. In other words, we need at least that much hydrogen sulfide in the air before an average person can detect it. There are some people that can detect it much lower, while others it requires a much higher concentration before they detect it. But if we look up at five and a half meters, we can see the general shape of the curve when it's very stable air that was similar to what was measured by that earlier research that we talked about. As we get into unstable air, we see very little change as we move downstream. So even without a shelter belt, unstable air is very effective in not in reducing the odor and or the hydrogen sulfide coming from the particular building. If we look at with one row of trees, we see now that the situation for one meter height is very similar to without any uh, shelter belt. Whereas in the elevation at five and a half meters that we have a decrease in the initial amount of hydrogen sulfide just beyond the trees, it was above 20 parts per billion before and now it's about 12, 13 parts per billion. But as we moved away from that, we have very little difference in effect. And if we go on to the looking at more trees, and we go all the way out to three rows of trees where we had the most of the porosity uh, decrease, we see that even at five and a half meters, 
there is very little difference between that and uh, one meter. So if we look at now just at the very stable condition, the E and F situation, and compare with and without shelter belts. So this top one line here, where we have the blue line on five and a half meters, this is without no windbreak, without any, without any shelter belts. Here is one row of trees, and here are three rows of trees. And so as we move away from the shelter belt, we find that there is very little difference beyond 500 meters with or without trees. The trees didn't have any effect on that. At the one meter height, there's very little effect and there's no significant difference between any of these values with our accuracy of our instrument. So translating all that, what does that mean? Our conclusions were that the effect on hydrogen sulfide of a shelter belt is most of the reduction occurred just beyond the shelter belt. Approximately after 500 meters, which is approximately a quarter of a mile or so, there's very little effect whether the shelter belt was there or not as far as being observed. Atmospheric stability certainly did have an effect on the dispersion and uh, its effect on, on shelter belts. So what is our recommendation based on all of this information? Well, for one thing, we would probably recommend that for the maximum effectiveness of a shelter belt, you really want the recipient to be just beyond the shelter belt. In other words, should we plant these shelter belts for the benefit of odor or hydrogen sulfide near the recipient? So if you take a, a farm place that's the neighbor's farm place that has a nice uh, machine shed on, he's maybe a crop farmer and, uh, and not associated with any kind of livestock, it would be appropriate if he would have a good shelter belt between he and the odor source. So that would probably be a recommend, recommendation. The other recommendation might be that if the uh, on the same site where the producer lives, that he placed a shelter belt between the odor source as well as the uh, where he lives. And so a, a good shelter belt around a manure storage structure or a building uh, would be very beneficial. Now these recommendations are only based strictly on the effectiveness of reducing hydrogen sulfide, which can be translated into uh, effectiveness for odor. That's not to say that there are not other very good reasons for planting that shelter belt around the building site or the source. And John did a good job of alluding to those such that you would probably put the uh, shelter belt around the source for aesthetics or you might want to put it around there for dust removal such as in a poultry unit or even in a, in a swine unit. And so the, just because we might not have the biggest bang for our buck in reducing the odor, there are many other good reasons for putting that shelter belt out. I would also like to acknowledge some of the uh, people that uh, helped uh, fund the uh, research, such as the South Dakota Pork Producers, Nebraska Corn Borer, uh, board as well as uh, several county conservation districts here within uh, South Dakota. What is our next step? Where are we going with this information? In South Dakota, we have a modeling tool that predicts the impact of odor on the community before a uh, operation can be built, and it's referred to as the South Dakota Odor Footprint Tool. It's very similar to the odor footprint tool that's used in Nebraska and very similar to the offset tool that's used in Minnesota as well as other places. And this tool really has a uh, effect of being able to predict the impact of odor. And you can see on the slide here, on the red line is a situation of how much we would have approximately 98% annoyance free at this distance from the source if this building was built in a certain uh, diagram. And then the blue line 
is if he put a, some kind of a technology in and reduce the impact of odor. And this te particular technology of this uh, example happens to be a biofilter. What we're doing now is taking this information that we've learned in this project and we're being able to create a uh, model that will be incorporated into the South Dakota Odor Footprint Tool as well as these other models that will be used now to, uh, for producers to say how much or how effective is that shelter belt, how much can I reduce my odor annoyance distance with, by putting in a shelter belt. And then we can uh, learn and use that effectiveness in siting our uh, future uh, hog units as well as our poultry units. So with that, uh, my contact information is there. Uh, I think I'll turn it back over to you, Rick, and uh, we 